I wanted to thank everyone for coming together today in something that I believe is a very significant announcement that we're going to be, a make, be making. As you know, in the past, uh, God, since I've become mayor, um, there's been a growing and evolving debate over the issue of homelessness. Uh, just yesterday, the council moved forward a bunch of sit lie bills. Um, we have the issue of Sand Island going on. But at the end of the day, um, what we're talking about is affordability. So, you know, the homeless issue is one sliver of the overall issue of affordability of homes on this island and in this state. And every one of us, every one of us struggles with it in one way or another. And since statehood in 1959, um, we have not accomplished the goal of building sufficient affordable housing for the residents of this island. And we've tweaked it and played with different ideas for a very long time. And so what we're announcing today is a major, major shift in addressing the affordability issue on Oahu and working towards getting more affordable housing built for the residents of this city and county. And we're going to be working very closely with the council members who stand with me today, Council Member Ron Manor, Council Member Ikaika Anderson, and Council Member Breen Harimoto, in part because each one of these council members introduced resolutions in the past six months or so saying we need to do more and asking the administration to step up and come up with proposals to do more. But also, I recognize in order to do this, we need the full cooperation of the council and also the public, the stakeholders, those who build units, those who are going to live in the units, those who help finance the units, Unless we're all involved in this together, we're not going to come to a position that's going to work. And it's not just about government mandating and expecting the private sector to respond. We need to come up with a proposal that works with the private sector and they'll actually build the units that we're asking to be built. So as you know, under the current system, generally speaking, if you want to get a rezoning to build homes, subdivision, an apartment building, a condo, um, you come in for a rezoning, at that point, the city requires that you build a certain amount of affordable housing. It's, a pro it's, about, it's usually 30%. And what we say is you need to build 30% affordable housing, and what that means is housing at 140% of average medium income or below. So that is a standard set, and actually 140% of average medium income is someone, is, what's the range at 140, Ember? What's that? No, a dollar amount for a family of four. Harrison, do you know? $134,000. $134,000 for a family of four. And most people say that's a pretty nice, healthy income. That's the requirement today. And what is happening right now is that where is the demand? The demand is for housing at 80% of AMI and below. And for a family of four, that is $76,000. But most people are not building to the, that demand, which is 75% of the demand. They're building in the 25% that goes from 80% of average medium income and up, and most of them are building at the 140% and up range. And it's understandable in a market system. They're looking for the widest margin, the greatest profitability, so if the market shifts, they don't fall into bankruptcy, and they make the money they need to make. That's the system that we see today. What we're going to be proposing for discussion with the public and working with the council is this, and it's a three-prong three, three approach. If you come in and you want to build a new project, right now it's, you get your rezoning. It won't apply that way. You pull a permit from the Department of Planning and Permitting to build 10 or more units. At that point, we're going to require one of three things for a developer to do. If you're going to do it on site, you can do rental housing, not at 30%, but at 15%. So 15% would have to be rental housing. But instead of it being 140% of AMI or below, it's 80% of AMI or below. So that's 76,000 for a family four and below. This is true, true workforce housing. This is true affordable housing where the greatest demand is and where the greatest need is that's not being addressed. And here's the other major point. We're proposing that it remain affordable rentals for 30 to 60 years. Right now, when you do affordable projects, 
they usually range from one year to 10 years. And the problem is, is that when you do that, it falls out of affordability very, very quickly. And it becomes a marketplace unit, and it's no longer affordable, and that is part of this ongoing problem we face in statehood that we want to change. We want to grow the inventory so that we actually have more affordable housing units for rental or for sale. So you're a developer, you say, I don't want to do rental, I want to build and sell. We can, you can build for sale on site, but 30% of the units instead of 15 have to be affordable, just like the current proposal. But again, at 120% of average medium income instead of 140% and for 60 years, 30 to 60 years, so a long period of time. If your developer says, I don't want to build affordable rental or for sale housing on my project, I want to keep it at the higher end, they can do it off site. But if they want to do it off site, it's all rental. You can't do for sale, it's all rental because that's where the greatest demand is. And again, instead of just 15% rental, it's 20%. So it goes up another 5%, and it's at 80% of AMI and below. So again, tr addressing that greatest demand. If you say, I don't want to do any, I don't want to build any affordable rentals or for sale units, we will allow a third choice we call an in lieu of construction fee. They'll pay in an amount to the city so they don't have to build it. And we're looking at, we're, we're going to need to work with the council and the stakeholders, but maybe around 20%, what it would cost to build affordable units on site for about 20% of the project. And that amount would be given to the city into a fund that then would be lent back out to folks who build true workforce housing for sale or for rental. And I, I think we prefer rental, like Stanford Cars Project, Holly Kawila Place, right, which is 80% of AMI and below. Great project just opened up in Kaka'ako. That kind of, that kind of project. We'll partner up and put the money back out there. So that's the one, number one prong of the, of this approach. Permit for 10 or more units, you fall into this new regulatory scheme of building what I believe is true, affordable workforce housing for rental or for sale that remains affordable for a period of 30 to 60 years. Okay, the second thing we're going to do is we're going to be reinstituting accessory dwelling units or ADUs. We like to call it affectionately Ohana zoning, Ohana dwellings. And we had a bunch of those at one point. Um, we have areas where they're permitted still. I mean, it's, they're no longer doing it, but around the island, and we have a chart we can hand out. We've calculated that the lots that could be used range between something between 17,000 and 22,000 lots. Some of them already have an ADU on it, so they wouldn't probably qualify. But what we're looking at is allowing an owner of a lot that qualifies, that's zoned correctly, to build an ADU on site, and it doesn't need to be for a family member, so it no longer be Ohana. It could be for someone that's not related to you, but perhaps it could be a caregiver who's going to live in the unit and help take care of you in your old age, or you could move into the smaller unit and allow your family to move in to the larger unit or someone else. And it's not expensive housing. We're looking at Ohana units that would be in the 1,000 square foot range Although we're open, because the larger the square footage, the more the rent is, we're trying to incentivize more units being built by homeowners around this island where, you can, where there were Ohana, Ohana units permitted before so that we get more affordable rentals on this island. And then finally, as we've talked about many, many times, transit-oriented development. As you know, we're working very hard to create zones in which uh, TOD zones where special things would happen. Uh, our major focus is on affordable housing within these TOD zones, close to transit stations where you have rail, where you have bus, and where you have bike, and where you may not need a car. A car costs us, on average, about $14,000 a year to maintain one car. So if you don't need a car, that's money that you could put into other things, rental or education or health care or just living better. And so we are going to really incentivize affordability within these TOD zones. We are going to have a financial toolkit that could include greater density, um, more height, no parking. So in a, a developer who wants to build affordable housing, they look at their costs diminishing 
which means their margin isn't so thin that they aren't, they're not going to lose money and they're willing to build this affordable type of housing. And of course, the city is also going to be taking on catalytic projects in TOD. So for example, at Kapalama, we're talking about actually investing substantial amounts of money for infrastructure and other things so it helps the developer build affordable housing. And then over in Pearl Ridge, as you know, the Live, Work, Play project, we're going to have a transit station right down by Pearl Harbor. We're going to look to buy the land there. Um, we're going to build a building above it that would have mixed income in it. We'd have a bus station. But these are the catalytic projects we're looking at to help incentivize more affordable housing. So these are the three approaches. One is regulatory, pull a permit of 10, and you've got to build a lot more rental or affordable for sale housing. Two, Ohana, bringing it back, ADUs, allowing it to happen. And three, moving forward on our TOD plan. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to the three council members who are here today. Mary, you want to talk about the goals? Oh, yeah. Um, or what I was thinking, why don't we, I've talked a lot, maybe Harrison, this is Harrison Rue, who's our TOD administrator, one of the great planners who's worked on projects all around our country. When we got them, people said, how did you score Harrison? Mayors and other cities would come up to me from big cities saying, you, you got a good guy. So Harrison, you want to emphasize some of the things we said with these charts? Uh, sure, Mayor. I, I would keep it simple. If we do everything in the plan, we work with council, we come out with a package and implement it, we'll be able to add the 4,000 over, over the five years. And you can see it adds up each year, and each year remains affordable. If you take that up 15 years, we've addressed half the problem. If the state follows similar things, which they're currently working on doing a lot in, in Kakao and other places, uh, they could basically double that same amount and you'd address 24,000 unit need over 15 years, and that would stay affordable again for three generations. Okay, now how about the other chart? I think we've talked about the need that you mentioned. Clearly, uh, we've, we've looked at a lot of research, clear need for 80% and below, and that's three quarters of the total 24,000 need. That's the reason why we're focusing on the need for rental and need for 88% and below, especially when a uh, city has any skin in the game. So while, that, we're, while we're on that chart, could I ask a question? By lowering the AMI from 140 to 80, I mean, it's a zero sum game, right? The market price for the units will have to go from 140 to 160. So you're basically cutting out the people who earn 140 AMI. Um, we've, we've started talking with developers. We're going to spend the next couple of months going back and meeting with them. With them. We've asked them to sharpen their pencils and look at their spreadsheets. There's a trade-off between reducing the AMI and reducing the percentage of units required and extending the time period. And for every developer and for their, their different type, we're asking them to look at their spreadsheets and tell us if this will work or not. But everyone that earns over 140 area median income can afford to buy a home. But now you're cutting them out, you're cutting out the middle. You're adding it on the bottom, you're raising it on the top, and you're cutting out the middle. When I guess I, the way I'd answer the question also is, so where, so we know where the demand is, and this is a chart on demand, where the demand is all at 80% of AMI. What are people building to? They're actually building at 140% and above, way above. The average price of a home being sold today, a new home, is somewhere around 750000 So that's not a family of four of 134000 Those are families making three and 400000 And so if you're saying, are we concerned about the impact it may have on that end of the market, I'm less concerned about it because I think they're able to afford, if they're buying in that range, they're more able to afford it these folks are not able to afford it, and it just gets worse every year. But Mayor, if they're selling it at 170, that's to pay for your 30 percent that you're trying to sell at 140. Imagine um, if you sell, raise, lower that to 120 or 80, that is going to raise it from 170 to 200. I mean, <laughs> assuming your 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 facts are correct, but here, but we don't know is what is their profit. You're assuming there's no profit, and whatever they make at one end, they pay for the other end. But obviously, every developer takes a percentage of profit off the table. And my understanding is that you go higher end in the market, the profit is larger, and they take that with them. They don't leave it and provide more affordable housing. 
They use it, you know, to pay their stockholders and everyone. I'm not saying it's a bad thing either. It's how the market works here. So you're talking as if whatever profit here they make here, they apply to the affordable. But I don't think that's how it works. I just don't think that's how this system is working. So. Developers have been telling us during, during the last few major rezonings, you know, if you require more of us, uh, if you require more of us in terms of affordable housing, it's going to cost more for the market homes to, in order to pay for them. What's your response to that? I said I want to see what their profit margin is. Well, I, people I like Paul. One more thing, Wayne, because I think you're mixing the rental and the ownership, which no, we've looked I'm at only. So uh, in, uh, in ownership, um, we would still be requiring 30% of the units at 120. We're not, we're not asking for ownership at 80% that, because that, that, that's unrealistic in terms of people being able to have the down payment. So there's not a big difference. The big difference in ownership is that requiring it to stay affordable for 60 years. Okay. And again, as you know, I mean, these numbers are different because we are sensitive to the question you're asking. I mean. Unless you sit on their side of the table and know what their numbers are and how they pencil out. Um, we're trying to anticipate what those, obviously we don't want to impose a system where nothing gets built. So where is that give and take exactly? And in this proposal, as you can see, we've, we've adjusted it on-site, off-site. The percentages change and also you don't have to do any of it. You pay in an amount. It's to get the right action. And obviously it's a draft proposal, so we're going to want each of the developers, the major developers, small developers in our city, to sit down with the council. They're going to be having hearings. Breen is having his first one on Friday to weigh in, to have that discussion to address your concern. But again, I just want to make the point that I believe that profit made doesn't mean it's plowed back into affordable homes. I believe it's reported back to their stockholders and investors as it is all around our country. And how much is left on the table is up to debate. For affordable housing but let's let's before we jump into more questions i did you have one more chart here is this you've covered everything <laughs> person i want to let the council members talk so we don't run out of time and then we'll stay and answer all your questions if that's okay so i'm going to turn it over first to uh, to ron menor i'm going to call him senator menor again and uh say a few words and we'll go ahead and then three yes um i'm, I'm very gr gratified about the mayor's uh, proposals and am very open to them because of the fact that they're very similar uh, to proposals, affordable housing proposals that I, I had uh, submitted uh, previously and that are still pending before the city council. For example, I introduced uh, two affordable housing resolutions that would uh, lower the definition of affordability from 140% of the area median income to 120% of the area median income. Uh, the resolutions would also require developers to increase the percentage of uh, affordable units that they set aside for low-income families whose incomes do not exceed 80% of the median. In addition to that, um, the resolutions that uh, the City Council was considering uh, would also uh, require developers to set aside a percentage of rental units as affordable rentals. Under the current uh, City Affordable Housing Policy, uh, developers are not required to set aside affordable rent rentals where there is a definite and clear need uh, in our community. And in addition to that, just as the mayor is proposing as part of his package, um, the uh, resolution that I introduced would also increase the length of time within, within which uh, affordable for sale and rental units would have to remain in the affordable inventory. Now, with respect to the uh, ADU proposal, I'm also very gratified that the mayor uh, has uh, submitted that proposal because just several days ago, uh, I introduced uh, uh, resolution 14-200 which would amend uh, the land use ordinance with respect to Ohana dwellings to facilitate and encourage the uh, creation of uh, ADUs. And I believe that uh, if this were to occur, that it could uh, result in a significant increase in the amount of affordable housing in our neighborhoods for, at prices that working families on this island can afford. Um, I just want to close by saying that um, our city is facing an affordable housing crisis. It's been estimated that, that by the year 2016 that we're going to have to provide approximately 20,000 rental units for low-income families whose incomes do not exceed 80 percent of the median. And of course we've also talked about the fact that uh, there is a correlation between 
uh, the lack of affordable housing and our homeless uh, problems. So I think uh, the city is going to have to take a bold and innovative action. Uh, there's no single panacea or a solution to the problem. It's going to require a multi-pronged approach. And so in that regard, uh, I think the mayor's proposals are moving us in that direction. So I look forward to discussing with my colleagues on the council the mayor's proposals as well as other proposals that have been floated to try to deal with this affordable housing problem uh, in the future. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Aloha. I'm very excited to be working uh, with Mayor Caldwell as well as my colleagues on the Honolulu City Council on the affordable housing crisis here in Honolulu. One of the solutions that's been missing from this discussion for a long time is, in fact, affordable rental housing. For whatever reason, so many of our working families are unable to be able to enter into the fee simple home ownership market. And we in government really haven't met that challenge, and I think you'd agree, Mayor, to go ahead and provide those affordable rental units for these folks. We did something similar with the Live Work Play IA project at the redevelopment of the old Kamehameha Drive In, where we did allow as an option for the developer to pursue affordable rental housing units that would be kept affordable at the 60 year uh, term. And this proposal that we're talking about now is extremely similar and I believe is based on that model that we've already allowed for. No secret, we definitely need to do more and I think this is a positive step in the right direction, but we really do need to do everything that we can to ensure that those folks who are not able to get into the uh, home ownership fee simple uh, area of housing have that ability to be able to rent. This is a solid step in the right direction. I look forward to more discussion tomorrow in the Zoning and Planning Committee. Thanks, Kaiko. Green. I'd just like to begin by thanking the Mayor for his leadership on this issue. We know that there is a severe shortage of affordable housing and an even more acute shortage of the low-income rentals. And I think this plan will help us to address that. We know that the, um, the current policy is not working and uh, what I really want to talk about really is TOD. So we know that with the train coming, there'll be private investment occurring around the rail stations. So we don't want to miss this opportunity. With this new bold plan, I think we'll, it would really help us to get more affordable units, truly affordable units in that TOD zone where I think the low income rentals are much needed because largely the low-income folks rely on public transit. Uh, many of them don't have cars. So we did not want to miss this opportunity. And I, I think the mayor's plan will help us to get there. Of course, there's controversy involved, but through the zoning committee, we'll have some hearings. And uh, we're hoping to have a robust discussion uh, about the plan. But uh, thank you for your leadership on this, Mayor. Amber, do you have anything you want to emphasize we left out? If not, now we're open to your questions. I mean, aren't we here because, because of that model? That's the reason we don't have affordable housing, is because it required developers to give 30% of their units at area median income. If you incentivized a builder to build 100% for the 80 percentile AMI, instead of trying to juggle 30% versus 140%, you would have affordable housing. By imposing that proposed island-wide requirement, you're bumping up the top end and you're lowering the low end. So it's, it's a zero-sum game? I disagree. Okay. And Wayne, I'd ask you, so the system that we have in place today is working. Is it working? No, it's Unless, not. It's and not. That, that's the same model, though. No, it's not. <laughs> it's a very different model than what has been in place. And what we see, as we've emphasized many times now this morning, go back to this. They're building in this range while the demand is in this range. They're building in this range while the demand is in this range. And they're building in this range because they can make more profit in this range. And it's a safer place to be if you're a developer. They, they are building within the program and system that we've mandated. They're not not building. They're, they are, there's a whole bunch of building going on right now. And they're building above 140, a lot. And when they have to, to comply with our requirements, they're building in this range, not in this range. We are trying to incentivize them to go to this range, but not saying at 140, 
Now, are not saying it at 30%, we're saying 15. We're giving a break of half. So to answer your question, we are trying to find, we're trying to calibrate, we're trying to adjust so that they will build in this range and still make the money they need to make. And we're gonna find out when it comes before the council. We wanna ask them. So I think you're jumping to a conclusion that we don't know the answer. I'm not, I'm not. all I'm saying is, it looks like a Robin Hood model to me. It's the same thing. I, What's I changed? Disagree. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Catherine, let's wait. Um, you can't go, go ahead. Very quickly, Mayor. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. The reason that many are saying that we're having difficulty providing homes at the 80% AMI level, which is really where it's needed, is because the current model calls for building fee simple homes. And for whatever reason, be it down payment requirements or whether it be credit reporting requirements, folks need to be able to meet that and still meet the 80% AMI if they're gonna qualify at that level. Very difficult to do in the fee simple market. But now when we're looking at building affordable rentals, we're taking away the requirement for that down payment, we're taking away the credit requirement, and we're, we're, we're being able to provide a home for rental uh, families. And I think that's an important factor to also include here. Because we're bringing that rental uh, part of the equation here and removing those other requirements that are very onerous for fee simple home ownership, it is a absolutely a step in the right direction. So, Catherine. Ohana Zoning. Yes. So, uh, what neighborhoods are you folks proposing uh, we allow this? So we, we provided a handout. Now, if you, there's a map that, yeah. it's so yeah. small, we, huh? We haven't provided Yeah, we didn't. Okay, we have, Ohana zoning is allowed around the island. Um, if I can just, the map is so darn small. But you know, just that, Catherine, it really goes around the entire, there's a lot in the, down, from Hawaii Kai, through town, through Kalihi, then out in the Waianae, Nanakuli area, then in the Haleiwa North Shore area, and then kind of, uh, this is Laie, yeah? Laie all the way down to Kaneohe. There's some in Waimanalo. So it's scattered around the island. So it's, there's, like I mentioned, around 17,000 to 22 lots ringing the island. They're all on the edge along, along the ocean that would allow Ohana dwellings. So these are sounding like older neighborhoods. It's not gonna be Mililani, it's not gonna be Kailua. Yeah, it's That's not correct. gonna be anything though. It could be, we could, we're talking about what's in existence. But again, we could look to expand. We're talking in current areas that we already have Ohana. But it could be opened up to other new communities, Mililani, other areas, new projects coming on, whole Pili, Coral Ridge. But we stopped at existing areas, but I'm not saying it needs to stop there. And there's part of that dialogue. That have already. Yeah. yeah. Just for clarification, yeah. so what uh, the mayor's been proposing and what I proposed through my resolution is to uh, expand the Ohana dwelling statute, which at present is limited to those who are related by blood marriage or adoption. What we're looking at with the accessory dwelling units is to expand that to allow uh, others to be able to benefit from that kind of a program. So that would include condominium property regimes? Also like Mililani? Well, it could, um, but, but th those are the kinds of issues that still would have to be Harrison, taken yeah. a close look at. So we're, we're actually proposing a, a two phase. The first phase is what council members are to the mic, please. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, we're proposing a two phase approach. The easy, quick one is to just deal with the existing Ohana zoning, which were the areas, because this was decades ago, it was the places that were developed decades ago, doesn't yet include Mililani Kapolei. That's a good point. So that's the easy thing to do is just change this, uh, the existing zoning. Second phase is to study those newer neighborhoods and see where it's appropriate to do the same thing. Right. Well, these older neighborhoods, because I live in one, and I know, you know what the realities are, is you have parking issues and other issues related to density in areas that really weren't set up that way. So you're penalizing those neighborhoods even more when they're already stretched. Yeah, we're, we're acknowledging those issues of, of working with the neighbors, looking at parking regulations, making sure there's infrastructure as part of the program. Yeah, so part of this proposal, and it kind of has, I just want to have, as part of it, it's not we're just going to, like, open the door and allow it to happen. We'd work again with the council. We'd look at infrastructure from sewer and water capacity to parking to refuse pickup, and some of these neighborhoods are issues, too. So we'd have to look at it, and we'd have to put in the regulations. So whatever happens, it's still dealing with health and safety issues, and we're not overburdening a system that can't handle additional capacity. And if it addresses those concerns, then it would go forward. But this would be part of the discussion through this draft proposal we'll be submitting. Now, Ikaka, you had a few words you wanted to add to that. Just very quickly, Mayor. 
we already have situations where you have uh, a husband and wife who are married with their children living with one of the uh, parents' parents. But what you have is these folks crowded into a home already, and you already have those issues with parking and density. We're just making it a lot more, less comfortable for them, if you will, to force them into living in their current conditions with this what will allow is for an expansion of the Ohana unit. They'd be there anyway. This is just gonna allow those families to live more comfortably. So I would argue that people are already doing this and we're seeing it island-wide where you have 12, 13, 14 people packed into one house. This would simply allow us to increase the size of the home in those areas that are already zoned for Ohana dwellings. I don't believe we're talking about expanding the allowability for Ohana zoning, at least not yet. I'm not seeing that, but we're looking at uh, opening that up for folks who are not necessarily related. But Good point. It just means that then you just allow then these rentals, a lot more rentals to develop in these neighborhoods. Yeah. And I think what we're going to do is we're going to have that discussion. Right. We're going to have that discussion. Uh, but right now, as I mentioned, we have so many people, 12, 13, 14 people packed into one home, rather uncomfortably. If we look at the Ohana areas that are already allowed for Ohana, and look at expanding that. You're gonna have the same amount of people living in the home, but you're gonna create a much more comfortable living environment for them. Um, also, to, Catherine, to, your, to answer your question, you're right. Um, in certain areas where the capacity issues can be addressed, where there's sufficient water, sewage, parking, you will have more people living in a neighborhood that currently live there. And why is that again? It's that we have such a pent up demand, as, as Council Member Menor mentioned, 20,000, you said? By, by, by 2006. 20,000 affordable rentals are needed, and they're not there. This is a way to help address it. Of course, we have the regulatory proposal. This is another way to address it. It's, it's different options to look at. And again, we're gonna wanna get the input from the public and address the concerns, very valid concerns you're asking. And if we can address them, I think it's a way to address the problem and get more affordable rentals on this island. Yes. I was wondering if that was an option that you had considered and why you decided not to include it in this um, proposal. Micro units are included. I just hit the high points today because we don't have enough time to talk about it for an hour. But we do have micro units of 350 square feet um, around TOD in particular. It's something that's really working well on the mainland. It's something that uh, Breen Harmoto is passionate about. The other two council members are. So in the appropriate place, um, it's something definitely we would look at and in our PowerPoint presentation, it's included. There's pictures of micro units and how to work. And we did look at the apple seed proposal and some of the things that you find in our proposal come from them. We're not reinventing the wheel, we're using the wheel that they looked at and others that have worked in other communities. At the end of the day, this program that we're looking at works in 500 municipalities around our country, these requirements that we're imposing. It's not new, it's new here, but it's not new in the rest of the United States. And it exists in some of the strongest real estate markets in the country, Boston, San Francisco. What are some of the others, Harrison? New York, Those, San, New York. San Diego. Yeah, San Diego, they, it exists. We're not like proposing something like, oh my God. And developers in those cities are working with this type of proposal. Now, yes, the conditions are different in San Diego than Hawaii. We know land, construction costs, materials are all much higher. That's why we're willing to tweak and adjust it. But again, it is a proposal that has worked very successfully in other cities where affordability is being addressed. The other issue I have, or the question I have, is the impact fees. And essentially, I put it in by the third category. I mean, you tried that with uh, golf courses when there was a runaway, um, a runaway development back then. Uh, I think we tried it with some of the other housing, like Royal Cunea and, and those places. Uh, how successful are we going to be with using that money? Is it going to be enough? Are, we going to, you know, are the rates going to be different than what we charged before? We're going to have to see. I mean, we have, we have not figured out exactly what that amount should be and how it would be implemented. But we do know, again, to address Wayne's concern, is how do we deal with developers who don't want to build the, they don't know how to build or they don't want to get involved in rental, 
but they're willing to pay some amount of money to get out of it, as you say, an impact, you call it an impact fee. It's a fund that would go into some kind of affordable housing fund to be used. Exactly how it would be used or something we'd be working with the council on. So I don't have a specific answer to your question at this time. Question for the council members. Um, currently, of course, uh, these housing exactions are, are uh, discussed at the zoning level. Under this proposal, this is going to change and this is going to be done administratively at the building permit level. Uh, how do you folks feel about that, especially since that means the council is not going to have any say on this anymore? That's a great point, Gordon. Uh, I believe, though, that this is something we need to, at the very least, consider. And that's why we're here. We're here to start these discussions because obviously what we've been doing all these years has not been working. Will this work? I really don't know. I'm not 100% sure. But we need to have these discussions. I, I am extremely concerned about the council transferring this authority to the administration, I'll be honest with you. But I think we need to at least have these discussions. And I'm willing to do that. But yes, I do have concerns about that. I think you've raised a very legitimate concern because um, it, one of the reasons why I introduced my resolutions uh, is because I felt that uh, it really is uh, necessary for the city uh, to strengthen our affordable housing policy so that it will be applicable to the large scale developments that uh, have been proposed or will be proposed in the future, which if we implement those policies could result in a substantial increase of affordable housing uh, in the future. So the issue as to whether it should uh, these uh, affordable housing requirements should be done at the zoning level as opposed to the permitting level. I think that that's an issue that's uh, got to be discussed more, more carefully and, and closely by the city council. L let me just add. The reason I submitted my resolution was it, to address that exact point. As the mayor mentioned, the current policy has it so that when rezoning occurs, the affordable housing policy kicks in. With TOD, everything is pre-zoned. The city pre-zoned, so there is no zoning to kick in the affordable housing. That was the disconnect with the current policy. So my resolution exactly was submitted for that reason. We need a different mechanism to ensure that we have affordable housing, especially in TOD zones. And uh, appreciate the clarification from my uh, colleague uh, because of the fact that uh, the uh, resolutions that I've proposed would apply to rezoning applications. And I think that it's going to be critical that at the time that the council uh, moves ahead with the rezoning, that whatever affordable housing requirements we feel should be applicable to, ve to developers should, should take effect at that time. I, just, I do want to emphasize um, what Breen said. I, where we went with this, the permit aspect was because of TOD. We believe that much of the affordable housing that's going to be built is going to be built around our TOD stations, although there is demand around the entire island. Why not and Nanakuli deserve affordable housing? Why Manalo deserves it? Holly Eva deserves it. But we recognize that much of the development will occur around the 21 transit stations that we have. And as Green mentioned, we're giving them the zoning up front. So how do we get them to build these things? It's when you, the only other trigger is pulling a permit. Um, and perhaps there's a balance between the two, whether it be when you're outside of the TOD, it's something else. This is something we're totally open to working with the council on. Hey, if, okay. I, if I could add on just, uh, and this is something that has not yet come before council, we're at about a 95% draft, 95% draft with that TOD zoning. It'll be coming up in the next couple months. And uh, council members, that does include the, the mix of, for large projects, it would require a special district that does come before council. For small to mid-size, if it's just, you ought to be able to go in and get your building permit, and, and the rules ought to be clear enough that you can just get your building permit if you meet the affordable housing rules. So that'll be the proposal in, in the TOD zoning. Carson, how close are we working with the state? Because the state is the largest landowner around all these TOD stations, and there is some concern across the street about, you know, are we going to be able to do this in a coordinated manner? Can you address that? Sure, sure. We've been uh, we've been working uh, very closely with several different uh, state agencies individually, uh, the Hous housing finance agency HHFDC. We've been looking at uh, different finance packages with them. We've been uh, working with uh, uh, the housing the Hawaii Public Housing Authority on on their mayor right homes. So they've got an RFI out there, and they're making sure that that follows the the TOD plan for Evale. We've been meeting with 
a group of state agencies in the Evil A area looking at several different state properties, and we just had a re meeting recently to look at the infrastructure uh, needed in Evil A as well as in infrastructure financing. We've been meeting with uh, each of the individual state campuses about the TOD potential around, uh, like, uh, uh, Honolulu Community College, Leeward Community College, UH West Oahu. We've also been meeting with uh, Department of Education folks about some of their ideas for potential redevelopment of some school sites. So there's a, a lot of, you're not seeing that in, in it's not newspaper ready yet, but there's a lot of stuff we're going on to make sure that we are aligning our priorities and making sure that what the state's thinking of fits fits with what the city's thinking of around TOD. Right, because otherwise you're gonna have problems where you've got a lot of concentration of people and not enough schools like we're already gonna be seeing in Kakaoko. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that we're doing on our end? Um, I mean, I, I know I've heard that a lot of the affordable units are going to be in the Eagle Bay area. Um, do we know rough numbers? That, that's in process. We're actually kind of looking at, at uh, uh, let's pick another example, uh, Kapalama Canal. We've been working with uh, uh, Kamehameha Schools because they have a master plan that's been incorporated into the TOD plan. And we, you know, they know their rough numbers, so we're looking at, at making sure there'll be sewer capacity. We're at the beginning, and that's been going on for years. We're at the beginning of that kind of discussion of exactly how many units there might be so we can address sewer capacity in the Evil A area. We'll know more in a few months on that. You know, I, I'm gonna, we're gonna wrap it up, but we will stick around on, if it's okay with the council members, could you stick around for one-on-one -on -one interviews? I wanted to thank everyone, but I want to conclude with this. You know, we've heard questions about whether this will work or not. Um, is it going to take more away from developers? Here's the point I want to make. The average price of a home this summer hit $700,000. It's dropped a little bit down. More and more of our residents and our children can't afford to buy a home or rent a home. And they're being forced to move somewhere else. And those who move to Hawaii, who have the money, are buying these more expensive homes. And what does that say for our community? And what kind of community are we going to be living in in the future? So we're throwing out a bold, strong, controversial new proposal to try to see if we can't get a different model in place so that we remain a balanced, healthy community where we have housing for every segment of our community and a stronger democracy. And I know the council members here today are passionate about doing that. I don't think we have the silver bullet, but I think we're on the way of coming up with a proposal that I believe will make a difference and provide more affordable rentals and more affordable for sale units. And so we're beginning that journey and we want to continue to work with the public to get their input with all the stakeholders. None of us are so latched into one idea that we're going to fight it no matter what. We're open to adjusting and using our great marketplace. I mean, I think the United States capitalistic system works, but it responds to incentives, it responds to regulations within that market, and that's what we're talking about today. So I want to thank each and every one of you for coming. We'll stick around for individual questions, and by the way, this is the beginning of a major dialogue over the next coming months with all of us here today. We want you to be a part of it. Thank you so much. Thanks.